Shalom, shalom, family. So great to be with you on another day. Hallelujah. The Most High is so good. I'm so happy to see all of you happy, shiny Hebrew people. If you hear my voice a little cracky, I've been up all night, essentially. And so I'm operating on, I think, maybe two hours sleep. So just pray my strength, please, as I get through this message. Just pray my strength. So we're going to be talking about these things today. The new mood in the appointed times. Now, all of us know about the seven feasts of the Most High, but we don't know the importance of the new moon. And it's something that's been lost to us. It's been lost to our nation. And it was prophesied that it would be lost. The Father told us and warned us that it would happen. And it happened just as he said. So as we look into these things, we're going to learn that the Father is so good and he has given us this new moon time as a special treasure. And I'm not going to get ahead of myself and get tell you more about it, but it's a wonderful time that the Father has established. Okay, what is the new moon? That is what we're going to be discussing today. So the whole um, crux of this message is to discuss what the new moon is and what role it plays in our nation. So here, and I know this is probably a little blurry on the screen for you, but uh, this is the best I could find. And But there are some scriptures here with the new moons in the, in the scriptures. They're not; These aren't all of them. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of them. And these don't even mention the times, the new moons mentioned in the book of Jasher or the book of Jubilees or the book of um, Second Esdras or the other um, books, the other extra biblical books. It's mentioned many times. It is a prominent time in our nation, in our nation's history, and we didn't learn anything about it in Christianity. Not a word. I had never heard about this. I knew nothing about it. Okay. So you'll see these verses of scripture where the new moon is mentioned. And if you read them, you'll see the importance of that role in those verses. So we're going to look at a few of them. I just screenshotted. So we're just going to look at a few of them. And, uh, and Esdras, or first Esdras 5.53 we read, and all who had made any vow to Alua began to offer sacrifices to Alua from the new moon of the seventh month, though the temple of Alua was not yet built. So this is a time, the new moon is a time where people made vows unto the Most High. They made promises unto him that they would do certain things, okay? And of course, they offered sacrifices. And the same chapter, verse 57 and they laid the foundation of the temple of Alua on the new moon. So the temple was of the, the new temple, the foundation was laid on the new moon. Okay. Um, chapter eight, verse six, first Esdras. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, in the fifth month, this was the king's seventh year, for they left Babylon on the new moon of the first month and arrived in Jerusalem on the new moon of the fifth month. Did you know that? Did you know that our ancestors left, at least some of them, Babylon on the new moon and arrived in Jerusalem on the new moon? I didn't. I didn't. It's a really important time in our nation. Okay. So continuing on. Well, this is wonderful, sister. This is wonderful. She says, I've been praying for this teaching for Sabbath understanding. Yeah, there's a lot about the Sabbath and a lot about the new moon that we don't understand. And so the father is revealing things to us. And so we're just trying to make ourselves available to him. So I'm, I'm grateful that he's answering our prayer. Um, Mezion says, I keep it as a Shabbat. Yeah, that's appropriate to do so. It's appropriate to do so to keep it as a Shabbat. Okay. But we're going to talk more about that as we get further on. Okay. So we read here and number chapter 29 Besides the burnt offerings of the new moon, so once again, we see that the new moon is a time where we're to bring burnt offerings before the Most High. It is a cereal offering and a continual burnt offering and its cereal offering and their drink offering according to the ordinance. There is an ordinance of the Most High to bring him offerings on the new moon, a pleasing odor and an offering by fire unto the Most High. Then Jonathan said unto him, meaning David or Daoud, Tomorrow is the new moon and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. A little um, backstory here. As you know, King Saul, Shaul, was trying to kill David. 
Daoud. And Daoud said, I can't go to the new moon celebration, the new moon feast, the new moon meal, because your father's trying to kill me. And then he's having this conversation with Jonathan and Jonathan saying, but if you're not there, they're going to notice that you're not there at the new moon. So this is the time where they got together and they ate a meal together. Oh, this all happened at the new moon. And for Samuel 20, so David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon came, the king sat down to food. So you see here the celebration, this feast during the time of the new moon. Continuing on in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial before your Alua, for I am Yahuwah, your Alua. So what we're to do at the beginning of the month is to blow a trumpet at the beginning of the month and over our burnt offerings. When is this happening? At the new moon. <laughs> At the new moon. So continuing on in Amos chapter 8, verse 5, we read, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the epoph small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances? So this is the most high speaking here, and he is telling his people, This is what you are saying in your heart. I hear you. I hear you saying in your heart. When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? So obviously the new moon is a time when you're not allowed to sell grain. You're not allowed to engage in barter or trade or business dealings during the new moon. And then he goes on to say, and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale. So you can see that the new moon and the Sabbath are both times when you're not to engage in trade, when you're not to engage in commerce. Okay. So that's another thing we've learned about the new moon and its relation to the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 19, we read, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Our people came into Sinai on the third new moon after they left Egypt. Didn't know that either. It just wasn't something that I paid attention to. And this is a significant time in our nation's history, as you will see as we move through this lesson. So they arrived. Yes. Yes, but yes, it is, um, Sister Angela, but not in the way that, not in the way that we would think based on our current schedule. Our current schedules are not the most high schedule. Our current calendars, I should say, they are not the most high calendars. They are, they are pagan. They are not. So we're going to get into how we determine the um, the new moon, okay? Okay, so continuing on. So they came into the wilderness of Sinai on the third new moon, or the, moon, the new moon of the third month, okay? So remember, they left Egypt the day after Passover. They ate the Passover on the 14th, and on the 15th, the Most High brought them out, okay? Let's see, um, thought I saw a question. Uh, Freya says, is it a one celebration or multiple day? one day. Well, it begins at the sighting of the, you guys are going to make me get ahead of myself. So I'm going to hold that question. I'm going to get to that as we get into that part, but just hold that question. Okay. Hold the question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Thank you Freya. Okay. So we're going to continue on first Chronicles chapter 23 verses 30 through 32. And they shall stand every morning, thanking and praising the most high Yahuwah and likewise at even. And whenever burnt offerings are offered to the Most High or Yahuwah uh, on Sabbaths, new moons, feast days, according to the number required of them, continually before Yahuwah, thus they shall keep charge of the tent of meeting and the sanctuary, and they attend the sons of Aaron, Aharun, their brethren for the service of the house of Yahuwah. So we're just learning here about the required sacrifices and the role of the priests regarding the Sabbaths, the feast days, and the new moons. So the priests were called to administer during these times, new moon included. Continuing. So now we're going to talk about um, Noah, because Noah uh, mentioned extensively the new moon. Well, he didn't, he didn't write it, but 
in the book of Jubilees where it speaks of Noah, we hear about the new moon often. So we're going to be looking into that right now. And it's really exciting as I was reading this and studying for this lesson, I thought, wow, I never saw these things before. It's just amazing. It's amazing. Thank you all for the gifts that you're giving. I appreciate your, your kindness. May the Most High Baruch you and reward you greatly for your gifts. Thank you so much. And so we're reading in um, the book of Jubilees. I'll let you know. I believe it's its sixth chapter. Yeah, I don't say what it is, but at the end I say. So you'll learn where I'm reading from at the end of the passage because I forgot to note that at the beginning. But it goes to, goes to us, it says, and on the new moon of the third month, he went forth from the ark. Noah left the ark on the new moon of the third month. I didn't know that. And built an altar on that mountain that he landed on. And he made atonement for the earth and took a kid and made atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth. So he made a sacrifice to atone for the sin that had been committed on the earth and for everything that had been, and for everything that had been on it that had been destroyed, save those that were in the ark with Noah. So this is another reference to the new moon. Noah actually left the, the ark on the new moon of the third month. It goes on to say, and on the new moon of the first month and on the new moon of the fourth month and on the new moon of the seventh month and on the new moon of the 10th month are the days of remembrance. They are days of remembrance and the days of the seasons and the four divisions of the year. So what they're saying here is that there, the most highest calendar is divided up into two, excuse me, into four seasons of what they're called remembrances, four seasons of remembrance. Okay. And that's how the year is divided up. And it begins in the spring and then you have the summer and you have the fall and the winter. So this, the calendar is divided up into four seasons, spring, summer, winter, fall. Our calendar does not begin with winter. It does not. It begins with spring. Okay. Continuing on. And these are written and ordained as a testimony forever, forever, not just for a while, not until Christianity comes, but forever. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. So he acknowledged the feast days of all the months and he acknowledged the special feast days, the special new moons at the beginning of the months that marked the beginning of the new seasons. Okay. There's one feast day that takes place on the beginning of the month that marks the new season. And that is the day of atonement. That's on Tishri one, the first day of Tishri. That is a new moon. How many of us knew that? How many of you knew that the day of atonement was on a new moon? How many of you knew that? I didn't, not until I started studying for this lesson. It's just amazing what you don't know. And it's just amazing how these things are hidden from our sight so that we won't know. Okay. So that we won't know. Sister Talmita, she did. She said she knew. Okay. Sister Radia said, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. These are things that we just weren't taught. So um, Devoria did. Okay. Sister um, 78 Vet didn't. So some did, some didn't. But now we're all learning and we're learning the significance of these things before the most high. Okay. So continuing on, these things are memorial and they were kept by Noah out of the ark. Okay. So I wanted to give you an idea of the months that we're talking about, because we're referring to the first month and the second month and all of that. So I just wanted to give you a picture of the months on the screen. So the first month, the most high told, um, Masha, Moses, this is going to be the beginning of months for you, Abib. They've changed the name to Nassan, but the original name was Abib, okay? It means when the barley is in the ear, Abib. So Abib is the first month of our Hebrew uh, year, and that is in the springtime. That correlates with March spring for our intents and purposes here. And then the fourth month, well, I can go through all of them. Ziv is the second. And then you have Savan, 
And then Tammuz, I hate to even say that name. You guys know who Tammuz is. Tammuz is the son of Semiramis and Nimrod, and he is worshipped. The three of them are worshipped as a pair, excuse me, a, tri a trio, a trinity of mother, father, son. And so our ancestors, unfortunately, after their time in Babylon, came back and they took this month, which was called the fourth month, and they named it Tammuz. This, is an, uh, this gives you an indication of the idolatry that was in our nation at that time. And so you have the fifth month, which is the month of, they call that Av, but it's Ab. And then Elul, sixth month. Seventh month is Ethanim. They renamed it Tishri. And then you have, that is the season of the fall. I forgot to mention that the month of Tammuz or the fourth month corresponds to the season of summertime. Ethanim corresponds to the season of fall. Okay. And all, there's also that the day of atonement on that day. Then you have the Mar, Mar Hishvan or Hishvan. Then you have Kislev, Tibet, Shabbat, and then you have Adar. And Tibet is associated with the season of winter. So you see the four seasons represented on the calendar here. And on the new moons of those times, it's a memorial. It's a time that's marking the beginning of the season where we're to go to the Most High for direction. Okay, don't get ahead of yourself, Maria. Okay. So continuing on. And on the new moon of the first month, he was bidden to make himself an ark. So brothers and sisters... On the first month, excuse me, on the first day of the new month, the new moon is when the Most High told Noah to build an ark. He received communication about the thing that he needed to do at the new moon. That's when it came. And you will see others in the scriptures receive communication from the Father about what to do happening on the new moon. Okay? So he goes on to say, and was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that day, the earth became dry, and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the new moon of the fourth month, the mouths of the deeps of the depths of the abyss had been closed. So the depths of the abyss were closed on the new moon of the fourth month. And on the new moon of the seventh month, the month of Tishri, which represents the fall season, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were open and the waters began to descend into them. So you see the most high draining the water off of the earth, but he's doing it in coordination with the seasons and the new moon. The, the father is just brilliant and he's, a, he's an allure of order and structure. He really is. Continuing. And on the new moon of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen and Noah was glad. And on this account, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever. And thus they are ordained and they placed them on the heavenly tablets. Each had 13 weeks from one to another past their memorial from the first to the second and the second to the third and from the third to the fourth. And what he seems to be saying here is that the distance or the space between the spring season to the summer season is 13 weeks. And the distance or the space between the summer season and the fall season is 13 weeks. And from the fall to the winter season, 13 weeks. Just, just order. It's ordered. It's structured. Just like the most I intended. And our calendar right now is just, it's, it's, it's a hot mess. It's so much so that we need a leap year. We need a leap year so we can get it right. The most size calendar is perfect. Continuing on. And all the days of the commandment will be two and 50 weeks of days, and these will make the entire year complete. Thus, it is engraved and ordained on heavenly tablets. Okay, this is Jubilees chapter six, where I've been reading verses one through three and verses 23 through 30. So what we're learning here is that the most high is ordained according to Jubilees that there are to be 52 weeks of days in his year, 52 weeks. It makes it a, a complete year, 52 weeks. That is what he's saying. No extra days, just 52 weeks. So here's the prophecy that we're going to get into now that, re that regards 
us losing sight of these things and forgetting these things and what will happen as a result of us forgetting the new moon and forgetting how the most high counts and establishes time. Yes, Talmita, it is a, a loony solar. It is both lunar and solar. It's not just lunar. It's not just solar. It's both because the most high gave us the sun and the moon both together to determine times and seasons and days and years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we're continuing on in chapter six of the book of Jubilees. And there was no neglecting this commandment, the commandment that we just discussed regarding the feast days and the observance of time. Okay. The, there is to be no neglecting of it is what this is saying for a single year or from year to year. And command thou the children of Israel, Yashara, that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and these will constitute a complete year. So our year, according to the book of Jasher, is supposed to be 364 days of 52 weeks. I'll say it again, 364 days of 52 weeks. And this will complete for us a full year. And he's saying here, they will, and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts. Don't disturb it. Don't change it. Don't alter it at all. Because if you do, all of your feast days will be in order. Everything will line up the way it's supposed to line up. But if you disturb it, you're going to have some trouble. Okay. You're going to have some trouble. Okay. Continuing on for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony. And they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. As long as you keep everything in order, all of your feast days will be in order. But if they do neglect it, if you do neglect to determine the new moon, if you do neglect to do the things that Father has told you to do regarding keeping time, and you don't observe them according to his commandment, then you will disturb all their seasons and the years will be dislodged from their order. And they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged and they will neglect their ordinances, meaning it'll be very difficult for you to keep your feast days in the time period that you're supposed to keep them because everything's now thrown out of order. It's no longer ordered. Okay. That's what he's saying here. And this is what he's determining will happen. Yes. Not 365 days, 364 days. Okay. Continuing. And all the children of Yasharah will forget. It's right there. All the children of Yasharah will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new moons. It happened. And the seasons and the Sabbaths and will go wrong. And will go wrong as to all the order of the years. And that's exactly what happened. We forgot. We forgot. We forgot our Sabbaths. We forgot our new moons. We forgot our seasons. We forgot how to determine the paths of the years. We forgot all of those things. It goes on to say, for I know, and from henceforth will I declare it unto thee, and it is not of mine own devising, for the book written before me and on the heavenly tablets, the division of the days is ordained. It has been written. And once the Most High ordains and writes a thing, he doesn't change. So, the way it's ordained in the heavenly realms is the way it has to be ordained for us today. And he's bringing us back to these things that we'd lost. Continuing. Lest they forget the feast of the covenant and walk, listen to this brothers and sisters, and walk according to the feast of the Gentiles. That's what we did. We did that. We began to walk after the feast of the Gentiles. And after their error and after their ignorance, we began to keep the Valentine's Day and the Christmas and the St. Patrick's Day and all those things. We began to keep their feasts. That's exactly what we did. And the Most High spelled it out for us. And this is exactly what would happen. And it happened just as he said. For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon and how it disturbs the season and comes in from year to year, 10 days or so, too soon, 10 days too soon. Now this is going to be significant, this 10 days. This 10 days, when you disturb the course that the Most High has laid out, there's going to be a 10 day problem. 
And as we continue this lesson, we're going to find the, one of the problems in the original Julian calendar was a problem of 10 days that they didn't know what to do with. So they said, well, let us devise the Gregorian. The Julian isn't working for us. So let's devise the Gregorian and fix those, that 10 day problem. So we're going to look into that in just a bit. Okay. Continuing on. For this reason, the years will come upon them and they will disturb the order and make an abominable day a day of testimony and an unclean day a feast day. And they will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean and the unclean with the holy. And they will go wrong as to the months and Sabbaths and feasts and jubilees. What is this saying? What is this saying? This is saying that as a result of us not observing the new moon and determining the days and the weeks and the months based on the most high's economy, but it's based on the, on his ordinances, we would lose track of time, his time, his timing, not Babylon's time, not Roman time, his time. We would lose track. We began to celebrate the feast days of the Gentiles, which happened. And when we disturb the order, we would make abominable days holy. We will begin to worship on days that we shouldn't worship on because we think that those are the days we're supposed to worship on. Sunday worship anyone? Sunday worship anyone? Didn't you think that Sunday was the day? When you were growing up in Christianity, didn't you think Sunday's the day? Sunday's the Lord's day. Didn't they tell us that? Sunday's the Lord's day. They told us that and we believed it. So we were making abominable days holy. We did that. Sunday is about the worship of the sun. It's about the worship of the sun. It's an abominable day that we were making clean before the most high, but you can't, you can't take a day that he has not chosen and try to make it chosen. You can't. Okay. And the, to read this and to see how the most high told us that these things would happen. It really just blows my mind. It really does. It blows my mind. Okay, but there are other days, brothers and sisters, that are yet unclean to us. And the Most High is bringing out truths to us regarding these things. There are yet days that are yet unclean. The feast days are off. The feast days are off right now. They're, they're just off because we're not, we're not operating under a 364-day calendar. We're not operating under 52 weeks a year based on 364 days. We're not determining when the new moons are. We're not doing any of that. So the feast days are off. The Sabbaths are off. They're all off. And we know it. We don't know what to do about it, but we know they're off. Okay? So we're just going to stand in that truth. They're off. And they will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean. So we're going to choose a day and we're going to say, this is our feast day. And it's not. Before the Most High, it's not. He's like, that's not the day I chose. That's not the day I ordained. That's the day you chose based on keeping the Gregorian calendar. But it's not the day I chose because I did not ordain the Gregorian, the Gregorian calendar. That's not mine. That belongs to Rome. He goes on to say, for they will go wrong as to the months and the Sabbaths and the feasts and the Jubilee. Absolutely. And it's exactly what has happened. OK, and now we find ourselves trying to find our way back to the truth, trying to find our way back to really keeping the feast of the Most High in a way that's honoring to him. And we're doing it. We're we're celebrating feast days. We're learning about them. We're selling celebrating them. But our timing is off because we can't determine when the new months are because we're not doing what we were told to do because we forgot it was taken from us. The knowledge was taken from us. Continuing, for this reason, I command and testify to thee that thou mayest testify to them. For after thy death, thy children will disturb them, meaning the months, times, seasons. Thy children will disturb them, Noah. I'm telling you, Noah, they're going to do it. So that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason, they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals. Everything is going to be thrown out of whack because they will not observe the time as I told them to do so. And they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. 
And that's found in Jubilees chapter 6, verses 31 through 38. And I am going to take a sip. Just a second, brothers and sisters. Okay, so once again, we found that these things happened. They happened just like the Most High said that they would happen, okay? And that is exactly right, Sister Deirdre, the little horn, he came in and he changed times and seasons and laws, and that's exactly what he did. You are so right. Absolutely, my sister. Absolutely. The plot is so deep. Brothers and sisters, when we are on the, the Most High's time, there is a grace there is a mercy, there is a connection, there is a power, there is an enabling that we have that they know about and they don't want us to have that. When we operate under the most high timing, celebrating the feast days when he tells us to at the right time, celebrating the Shabbat when he tells us to at the right time, the new moons at the right time, there's an anointing that comes, there's an enabling that comes and they don't want that for us, of course. So all the days are just, it, they're a mess. They really are. They're a mess. So let's continue on in this lesson. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is the most accurate calendar used today. This is what they're saying. I do believe that there are more accurate calendars than the Gregorian, but this is this article's opinion. And it says almost all countries around the world are using it. Oh, that makes it accurate because countries are using it. But I digress. And it is also the standard measurement of time used by the ISO. It was introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th in the year 1582 with the help of two Catholic scientists named Alonius, excuse me, Alonius Lilius a doctor and philosopher and astronomer. And Christopher Clavius, this is really small, <laughs> Christopher Clavius, an astronomer, objectives. The main goal in establishing the Gregorian calendar was to get an exact date for what, for what brothers and sisters? Their Easter. Their Easter. Remember that 10 day problem we talked about earlier, how the Most High said, if you don't keep my statutes, if you don't keep my calendar the way it's supposed to, you're going to have a problem of that 10 days. They were having that problem the 10 days, so much so that Easter kept changing. <laughs> they wanted to have it in March, but it kept changing, kept, it was going to move to February and then to January and then into December because they weren't keeping the time schedule according to the Most High. So they're like, we got to fix this. We've got to fix this. So let's continue on. The main goal is to get the exact date of their Easter Sundays, which coincide with the Jewish Passover. It is also aimed at replacing the already inaccurate pagan-made Julian calendar, which was introduced by the pagan Julius Caesar in the year 46 BC. The, the Julian calendar is 11 minutes ahead of the actual tropical calendar, such that by the year 1500, it was already 10 days out of sync with the seasons. The 10 day difference was causing frustrations for sailors, merchants, and farmers whose livelihoods depended on the seasons. In the Gregorian calendar, one day is added to a leap year if the year is divisible by four. But if the year is evenly divisible by a hundred, it is not a leap year. Oh, this is so confusing. If the year is divisible by 400, it is a leap year. Okay, so Catholic states such as France, Italy, Spain, Poland, Portugal were the first to change the Gregorian calendar. Thus, on October 4th, 1582, it was followed by October 15th, 1582, a 10-day period skipped. So this is how they solved that 10-day problem. That's what they did, brothers and sisters. This is how they solved the 10-day problem. They said, <laughs> we're just going to take it off the calendar. There it is. Oops, it's gone. This is what they did. That's 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 the wisdom of uh, of Babylon. They just took it off the calendar. So these people began their month with the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. So the fifth is gone, the sixth is gone, and all the way to through the fourteenth. If we count that, that's ten days. 
So 10 days just went poof from their calendar, gone. Okay, so this is how they decided to try to fix the error within the Julian calendar by replacing with the with the Gregorian calendar in 1582, taking those 10 days away. Okay, and then they established this idea of the need for a leap year and years that are divisible by 400 and 100. And so every fourth year of the even months or years, there's an extra day in the month of February. And oh, my goodness, it just makes my brain hurt. It's just, it's just, it's just confusion. And the most eyes calendar is perfect. Okay. Sister Lydia said there's a troll on board. So there's a troll on board. Okay. I'm asking you, um, moderators, you wonderful moderators, handle it, please handle it. Thank you for the heads up sister, um, messenger. Okay. So somebody says, we should never be surprised by the lunch of Gentiles will go to blast from our power. Absolutely. Absolutely. So somebody had a question. Let's see. <laughs> yes. They took away our days and added it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. That's what they mean. Absolutely. Okay. I'm glad you guys are tracking with me. Okay, good. Thank you. Sister, we got him. Thank you, Sister Raya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So you always know when you're striking a nerve, you know, when the trolls come out. So anyway, I'm just teaching what the most I told me to teach. That's my job. I'm just saying what he wants me to say. The rest is in his hands. So this is the calendar right now, brothers and sisters, that we're living with in Babylon. The calendar that took 10 days out in the year 1582. This is the same calendar. We're still living under the Gregorian calendar. Okay, this is it. So days of the week, we're just going to briefly talk about the days of the week because, and I'm, I'm going to mention them because I want to just demonstrate to you how the whole thing is pagan, 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 just pagan, the whole of it, the months, the days, the years, the timing, everything. It all goes against what the Most High established. Our ancestors did not name days, but these people did. So let's learn a little bit more about it. So what we see here is an example of the days of what would be considered a week in our economy and in, in Hebrew culture. Okay. They did not name the days like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They didn't do that. They numbered them. And so these names are numbers. So the first day is called the first day. The second day is called the second day. The fifth day is called the fifth day, okay? So once you get to Shabbat, the Shabbat is called the Shabbat, which is indicative of a day of rest. And it's also indicative of the, the number seven, which is Shabbat. Shabbat means seven, okay? So Shabbat together, is taking into account Shabbat for seventh or seven, and also a ceasing or a rest. So it, it kind of literally means the seventh day of rest. That's, that's pretty much what it means. So that is how we indicate the days of the week. We didn't name days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The father didn't come up with that. Rome did. The gods behind the days of the week. The origins of our days of the week lie with the Romans. The Romans name their days of the week after planets. We talked about this last week, brothers and sisters. We talked about Saturn. We talked about these things and how so much of the society in which we live is based around pagan worship that goes all the way back. The Romans name their days after the planets or the wandering stars, which in turn were named after Roman gods. Dies Soles means the day of the sun. They say that the sun was then considered a planet or a wandering star. But we know that the sun isn't because the sun is still doing what it was commanded to do. But they still worshipped it. And I think the quote-unquote God associated with the sun is the quote-unquote God, Apollo. Okay? So it's really Apollo worship. Dies just means day. It just means, it's in Latin, it means day. So dies lune is the day of the moon. Dies martis is the day of Mars. Dies mercury is the day of Mercury. And this is what would be associated with Wednesday. Martis would be associated with Tuesday. 
lunes would be associated with um with monday but as i look through these you know i took a little spanish in in high school and as i look at these when you read them in the english it doesn't necessarily demonstrate to you the connection between these days and the pagan days is when you look at it in another language. When you look at these uh, days of the week in Spanish, for example, um, Sunday is domingo. It's domingo, which is indicative of like domination or dominion. And the sun is supposed to be like the primary Apollo worship having dominion in the skies and in the heavens. Um, the Monday in Spanish is lunes. And you can see the connection between that and the worship of the moon. In Spanish, um, Tuesday is um, martes. And you can see the connection between that and Mars. Wednesday in Spanish is miércoles, Mercury. In Spanish, Thursday is jueves, after Jupiter, yovos in Latin. Friday is viernes, or is that the season? It's been a few years since I've taken Spanish, so forgive me. For Friday, it's the worship of the goddess Venus. And um, Saturday, Saturni, which is to be the worship of Saturn. And we discussed that last week. Note, brothers and sisters, Saturday, Saturn worship. Saturn's day. Saturday, Saturn's day. Don't miss that. Don't miss that, okay? So it's all pagan. I'm telling you, it's all pagan. And the more you look into these things, it's just all pagan. It's just all wrong. Yeah, Saturn's day. So our ancestors did not choose one day of the week to keep Sabbath. They did not. The Sabbath was determined by the new moon. There was a change made and it was under Judaism. And they decided to choose one day, Saturn's day, for worship, to create and turn into Shabbat. Okay? But that's not the topic of this, of this teaching, so I will continue on. When the Germanic-speaking peoples of Western Europe adopted the seven-day week, which was probably in the early centuries of the Christian era, they named their days after their, those of their own gods, who were closest in attributes and character to Roman deities. Restated, when these things went from Rome to the surrounding areas as the Roman Empire continued to grow, and these people were learning up the, about these days of the week, they're like, well, I don't want to call these days what they're calling them. I want to call them by my own deities, which just happen to have similar characteristics which happened to have similar characteristics to the characteristics of the deities of the Romans. Okay. So they wanted to use their own names or their own gods in their days of the week. Okay. It was one of those peoples, the Anglo-Saxons that brought their gods in language that would later become English to the British Isles during the fifth and sixth centuries AD. In English, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday are all named for respectively Saturday is associated with Saturn. Monday is associated with the moon. And Sunday is associated with the sun. Clearly. But the other days. The remaining four days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, are named for gods that the Anglo-Saxons probably worshipped before they migrated to England and during the short time before they converted to Christianity. After that, Tuesday is named for the god Twi about whom relatively little is known, but Twi was probably associated with, the, with warfare, just like the Roman god Mars. Wednesday is named for Woden, who was paralleled with the Roman god Mercury. Okay, you see the parallels. Probably because both gods shared attributes of eloquence, the ability to travel, and the guardianship of the dead. Okay. Continuing on. Thursday is Thunor's day, or to give the word its old English form, Thunrestag. <laughs> I, I was I 
was trying to practice this. This is this makes no sense to me. I was trying to practice this so I would get it right for you guys. So I'm trying, okay? This is just such a this is afflicted word. I don't know if you remember the word afflicted. This is afflicted word to me. So it's thunristig, which means the day of thunder. This sits beside the Latin day dies Jovos or Evos, which is the day of Jove or Jupiter. Both of these gods are associated with thunder in their respective mythologies. You may recognize the similarity here between, excuse me, here with the name of the infamous Norse god, Thor. Avengers, anyone? Avengers, anyone? This may be more than a coincidence. Vikings arrived in England in the ninth century, bringing their very own similar gods with them. Anglo-Saxons were already Christians by this time, but may have recognized the similarity between the names of their ancestors' deities, Thunor, and the Norse god. We don't know, but the word Thor does appear in written texts from that period. Okay? So Thursday is essentially about Thor's day or the worship of Thor. Friday is the only day of the week named for a female deity. Frigg, who is hardly mentioned anywhere else in, in, in the early English. The name does appear, however, as a common noun meaning love and affection in poetry. That is why Frigg was chosen to pair with the Roman deity Venus, who was likewise associated with love. And I, I, I copied, I blotted out the word, but you can imagine what comes after love if it starts with an S. So I'm just going to leave that there. I blotted it out. It's we're talking about set apart things, and I did not want that word on the screen. But you can see it begins with an S. So Venus is associated with the word with love and a word that starts with S and has three letters. And was commemorated in Latin, in the Latin name for the word for the name Friday or the day of the week Friday. In early Christianity, the reckoning of time was crucial to the proper celebration of the church's feast day, especially their venerable day of Easter. So they were only really concerned about making sure that the clock or the calendar lined up so that they could celebrate Easter in the time that they wanted, which was, it was to be celebrated on the first Sunday after the full moon following the spring equinox. And because of that 10 day problem that I mentioned, the, the time, it kept moving. It would move. It would move into February and then eventually into January, eventually into December, unless they changed things around so that they could have their Easter, their pagan Easter celebration in March. And sometimes they have it in April because their calendar won't stand still for them. It keeps moving. But the Most High's calendar stands firm and stands sure. Hallelujah. The Most High's way is perfect. It's perfect. So we're going to be reading a verse of scripture here in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, where we see Solomon talking about the intention behind the building of the temple and the ways in which he intends to worship the Most High through it. And Solomon sent to Hiram, the king of Tyre, saying, and then I skipped to verse 4, Behold, I build a house to the name of Yahuwah, my Alua, to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense, and for the continual shoe bread, and for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, and on the Shabbats, and on the new moons. What, what does he say? The new moons. He's saying that our Shabbats, and our feasts, and our festivals are all a part of the worship of the Most High, brothers and sisters. The new moons, they're not to be left out. They're not to be ignored. And on the solemn feast of Yahuwah Aralua, this is an ordinance forever to Yasharal. So when we come back to the Most High and we celebrate our Shabbats and our solemn feasts, we can't forsake the new moon. It's all a part of the things that we're supposed to be doing before the Most High forever. We can't forsake the new moon. We can't. In Yasha, Yasha Yahu, Isaiah 66, we read, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, so we know that the Father is speaking here of a future time, 
This is a future prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says Yahuwah, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another new moon, and from one Sabbath to another Sabbath, shall all flesh come to worship before me. Brothers and sisters, the Most High is telling us that the things that he ordained are forever. The new moon is supposed to be a part of our celebratory time before the Most High, just as Shabbats are. They're just as important as Shabbats, that we have not been acknowledging them because these things were taken away from us. We didn't know. We just didn't know. But now that we're coming into an understanding of these things, we need to return back to these things that the Father has called us to. It's important. It's really, really, really important. Oh, Kafaya, why are you crying tears of joy? Why are you crying? Oh, you're going to make me cry. Okay, what's your question? What's your question? Ask the question. I'll pause a second. What's your question? Yes, Sister Kathy, it was inserted. Absolutely. They inserted it into the scriptures. They inserted Easter. They absolutely did. Yes, they did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, Brother Arthur says, the moon is our habitation to Yah. Obeying his laws is a must. The moon don't change like men do. Keep your eyes to the skies. Yes, my brother. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Okay, Sister K uh, Cassandra, I'm waiting for your question. Yes, this is really important. And I haven't even gotten to all the reasons it's important. It is super, super, super de duper important. It really is. And when the father brought this up, I was like, whoa, wow. It's amazing. It's really amazing. Okay. Talmita says, just got a revelation. Sabbath determined by the solar calendar. Moon, new moons are determined by the lunar calendar. Well, actually, sister, they're both determined by the same lunar calendar, but it is contingent upon the sun. And I'll explain that as we get to the near to the end, but you're on to something. Okay. I know your, your, your mind's thinking you're on to something there. So just hang with that thought until we get to the end. Let's see if I can find sister Cassandra's question. If anyone's interested in seeing the renewed moon for the first time and want to observe it, it's expected to appear. <laughs> yes. Now, now, now think about this brothers and sisters. The Most High insisted that I teach this lesson, the Shabbat. He insisted. I had something else that he had already given me that I was going to teach. And he happened to have me teach this lesson around the time of the new moon or the renewed moon, as Brother Michael so excellently points out. And I actually address that in this lesson, that the more accurate way of describing it would be the renewed moon. Hallelujah. He is so perfect. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you want to, if, yeah, yeah, you're free to say something, Sister Talmita. Sure. Okay. I want to ask a question. Do you still attend? Uh, no, no, I don't attend church on Sundays. I don't. I don't attend church. Um, and, and the reason is, is because the Father did not call us to church. He called us to covenant relationship with himself. The church, such as it is, has nothing to do with us. It's a religion. And the Father did not call us to religion. He called us to relationship. He called us to his Torah. He called us to his son. Messiah did not call, excuse me, Messiah did not establish a church. I know it says that in your Bible. But if you look at that word, it's not church. It is ecclesia. It means assembly or congregation. The same assembly and the same congregation that you had in the Old Testament, what they call the Old Testament. The same assembly, the same congregation of the righteous. So it's not necessarily a new covenant that the Yahusha, Yahusha came to establish. It was a renewed covenant, just like the renewal of the moon. It's being renewed. So no, I don't recommend it. I recommend we come out of Babylon. The church, such as it is, as, as it is, is part of the Roman Babylonian system. Okay? Protestant religion is based on Catholicism. It's not what the Father's calling us to. So 
be in prayer about coming out of those things, okay? Be in prayer about that. Okay, um, let's see. Duh, 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 duh. Okay, you guys, now I'm trying to be rude, but when I'm talking to people about the Sabbath, how do I justify it? I don't know what you, what do you mean? How do you justify it? How do you justify that you're supposed to keep it? It's, it's, it's a commandment. It's the fourth commandment. But beyond that, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Can you clarify, sister? Can you clarify? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. That's the little sliver. So actually, according to my schedule for where I am, the new moon is today. As I am teaching this lesson to you, it is the new moon. It's the new moon. It's, it's today. So the new moon begins the night before at the first sighting of the little sliver, and then the next day. So the next day would be considered the first day of the month. So if we were keeping time right now, this would be the first day of our new month today. Okay. And this is how they did it. That's how they did it. Yes. It's also very pagan, very pagan. Okay. So I'm trying to see what the question was, but I got to get back to this teaching. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. The last time I went, I wanted to run for my life. <laughs> yes. Sister Malaka says, I have been praying for this. I have, I was becoming frustrated, feeling alone in this. And I went to Abba about it. And now look, all praise to Abba Yah. Yeah, Sister uh, Malaka has been awakened to this truth about the timekeeping for a while. And um, the Father's faithful. The Father's faithful. <laughs> Sister Jill says, once you leave the church, you will go closer to the Father. You will. You absolutely will. So the question is Psalm 83, 81, 3. Can you put it in the chat, please? Can you put it in the chat? That way I don't have to look it up. Just, yeah, put it in the chat. <laughs> Miss A says, the church is an error. The most I called me out of church over a year ago. Yes. Yes, it is. It's not teaching truth. Miss Beverly says, I saw that new moon last night too. Yes, I'm so excited. When I realized that the father had called this lesson, Brothers and sisters, I could just cry right now. I'm going to try to hold my composure. I'm going to try. When I realized that he had called forth this lesson on the new moon, on the new moon, he's just so brilliant. I can't. I just can't. I can't. He's just so perfect. It's just perfect. It's perfect. Okay, I'm gonna try to um thank you, sister. Oh no, is this the is this the scripture? Sound the ramps. Oh, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. I'm so glad it came. I'm so glad. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon, and when the moon is full and the day of our festival. Why does it say full? Because it's talking about our feast days. We sound the ram's horn at the new moon, and when the moon is full, it's the day of our festival. If you think about the day the feast day that falls on the 15th day of the month. Does anybody know? I'm going to ask you, think about a feast day that falls on the 15th day of the month. Can anybody tell me of, of a month, not English months, but Hebrew months. Can anybody tell me the 15th day of the month? Can anybody tell me a festival or a feast day that falls on the 15th day? 15th day. I'm waiting on you. Hallelujah. Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. So the psalmist is saying, blow the trumpet on the new moon and blow the trumpet on the full moon at Passover. Passover unleavened bread happens on a full moon. And I will show that to you in just a bit. It happens on a full moon because when you start adopting the Most High's calendar, there is so much order. You know exactly when to find what. 
And so Passover every year, as long as you're celebrating it in accordance with the Most High's timekeeping, is always going to happen around the full moon. And that is what that's referring to. Okay? The full moon. Okay. With all due respect, last night was not the new moon, but the ending of the waning moon or the closing of the month. See, I didn't see it, Kafa Yahoo. Okay? I just Googled it. So I'm not here to argue. I'm, I'm sure you're right. Okay? I'm sure you're right. So you're saying it was the ending of the waning moon or the closing of the month. Okay? I have no reason to doubt what you're saying is true because I didn't view it with my own eyes. All I did was Google it. But what I know is this lesson is happening around the time of the new moon, and I'm grateful for that. It could be last night. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. But it's happening around the time of the new moon. So I'm on to that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, sis. Thank you, Sister Ruhama. <laughs> Toilet paper works. <laughs> It works. It really does. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So let me get back to the lesson. All right. So we're seeing here in this verse of scripture that the new moon and the Sabbaths, they're not going anywhere. The Most High is giving us a prophetic utterance here, telling us right now that in the kingdom to come, all flesh is going to come and worship before him from one new moon to the next new moon and from one Sabbath to the next Sabbath. This It's not going anywhere. So what he's doing is he's reestablishing these things before us now. He's teaching us again now. And I'm grateful for uh, Kafa Yahoo and others who have been in this truth, Sister Malaka and others who have been looking into these things and learning these things. You know, I'm grateful for them. And I'm grateful for the role that they play as the Most High continues to bring out truth. He wants us in truth, brothers and sisters, all the way in truth, not halfway in truth, all the way in. Okay? Continuing. So what was the significance of the new moon in Bible times? What did it, what did it mean? What, why was it important? The significant, significance of the new moon in Bible times is that it marked the beginning of the new month. This is, this is just one reason. It's a pretty important reason, but it's just one reason. But it's, everything is hinged upon this. You determine when the Shabbats are, you determine when the feast days are, you determine how your calendar goes. Everything is hinged upon knowing when the month begins. And you determine that by the sighting of the waxing slither of the crescent moon, not the waning, but the waxing. And I will get into waxing and waning in just a second. Okay. So when you determine what that is, then you know, you have the new moon and then you can schedule all of your feast days, everything for the month around knowing when the first day of the month is. So the new moon is the first day of the month. Okay. And Let's go back to the beginning because I don't remember where I was. The significance of the new moon in Bible times is that it marked the beginning of a new moon on the Hebrew lunar-based calendar. It And it was a time when the Israelites, Yasharal, were to bring an offering before the Most High. Absolutely. The beginning of the month was known not by astronomical calculations, but by testimony of messengers, witnesses appointed to watch for the first visible appearance of the new moon, just like you guys were doing last night. You guys were acting in the role of watchers as you were sitting, looking. You don't even realize what you're doing, but as you were watching the moon, you're watching to see when is the cycle ended? When are we in the dark phase? And when have we moved into the waxing crescent moon? That's what they did. They watched the heavens to determine when the new moon started. That's what our ancestors did. That is what we must do. As soon as the first sliver was seen, the fact was announced throughout the whole country by signal fires on mountaintops and the blowing of trumpets. The Hebrew word for month is Kodesh or Kodesh literally means new moon. And as I will discuss earlier or later with you, it means really renewed moon. Okay. Continuing. In Numbers 28, 11, the new moon offering is commanded for the first time on the first of every month meaning the first day of every month, the new moon, present to Yahuwah a burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, and seven male lambs a year old, without defect, all without defect. 
Each of the animal sacrifices was to be accompanied by a grain offering and a drink offering. In addition to burnt offerings, a goat was to be sacrificed to Yahuwah as a sin offering. The new moon festival marked the consecration to Alua of each new month of the year. New moon festivals were marked by sacrifices, the blowing of trumpets over, the, over their sacrifices, and the suspension of all labor and trade and social and family feast. So they got together, they feasted, they had a meal before the Most High. They did not trade, they did not barter. They rested. It was like a Shabbat, but not one of the Shabbats in the month because there are, Shabbat, there are four Shabbats in every month and one new moon. It's set apart from the Shabbat. It's a little bit different than a Shabbat. Similar, but a little bit different, okay? Continuing. There's a screenshot that I took from a video that I was watching on this topic, and it says, the new moon is still, and the Shabbat originally was dependent upon the lunar cycle. The, originally, the new moon was celebrated in the same ways as the Shabbat. Gradually, it became less and less important while the Sabbath became more and more a day of religion and humanity, of religious meditation and instruction, of peace, the light of the soul. Okay, and the source of that is found there on the screen. But the, the, the crux of this quote is just that, to determine or to express to you how the new moon and Shabbat were determined by the sighting of the new moon. You can't have a proper understanding of the Shabbats. You can't even keep the Shabbats on the correct day without knowing when the new moons are. So that's why I said, and that's why the scripture says, as we read in Jubilee chapter six, that we would take profane days or unclean days and make them holy. We were taught as we came into the awakening that worshiping on Saturday was what the father ordained. We were told that the sat Saturday was the seventh day. It is not. It is not. The seventh day is determined by the sighting of the new moon. The new moon from even to even. And this is from BibleGateway.com. This is a commentary that I've, I've screenshotted for you. It says the new moon. In 1 Samuel chapter 20 and 2 Chronicles, Isaiah 66, the new moon, the expression of the day of the new moon occurs. But generally itself, it means the day on the evening in which the new moon appears. And what this means is that the sighting of the new moon happens at night. It happens at night. So when you see that slither at night, the new moon begins. So it's from even to even, from evening to evening. So when you have that first slither of the new moon sighting, as Brother uh, Yahoo was saying, when you have that sighting from that point on to the next day at even, that is the new moon, okay? The new moon night and the new moon day. The term has three biblical connotations. The monthly festival, the new moon, the day of the chronological point of reference, and also the new moon by extension as a synonym for Yera. The word Yera means moon in Hebrew. That's what it means. It's, it's Yera or Yara. It just means moon. It means the physical moon. So notice that new moon is uh, Rosh Kadesh. It does not mean necessarily new physical moon. It's talking about a renewal of something. It's about a renewal, a restoration of something that was light. It went dark, but the Most High is going to bring it back to light again. It is also the period between the new moons, particularly with the names of, of months. Um, Abib and Exodus always with Babylonian names, unfortunately, and the rest of those scriptures. Unfortunately, they came in those Babylonian names. Okay. So I'm taking a sip. So pardon me a second. Continuing, also on the 10th day of this seventh month, which is the month of Tishri, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, and you shall celebrate your Shabbat. 
So why did I include this verse of scripture? It doesn't have anything to do with the new moon. The reason, <laughs> yes, sister, stay hydrated. <laughs> Thank you, sister Ruhama. Stay hydrated. <laughs> the reason I'm mentioning this is because there has been some question uh, within our nation as to when the Shabbats begin. And that's something I've been asking the father about as well. Some people say the Shabbat begins at even and then runs 24 hours to the next e evening. Some people say it begins on that morning. It runs 12 hours and then that's the end of it at, at that evening. And some people say that it, run, that it begins in the morning of the day before of the sixth day and then ends at the morning of the seventh day. I mean, there's all of this debate as to when it begins and when it ends. And I wanted to put this scripture on the screen because I believe that the scripture is making it very clear to us. The scripture is telling us that as we celebrate the feast, the day of atonement on Tishri one, that it shall be uh, on the ninth day. Okay. No, this is, um, this is, yeah, day of atonement, the day of atonement on the 10th day of the seventh month. They're telling us that this is going to be like a, um, like a Shabbat. It's telling us this is like a Shabbat. It's not one of your Shabbat days, but it's going to be like a Shabbat. Here's how you celebrate it. So I believe it's telling us here how to celebrate a Shabbat from even to even. You see that brothers and sisters, the ninth day. So the feast begins on the 10th day, but it tells you to begin on the ninth day at evening and continue on until the 10th day at evening. And I believe that is what is telling us in terms of how to celebrate our Shabbat from evening to evening. Okay. And that's why I'm putting this in here because it's, I believe it's confirming to us when the celebration of the Shabbat are to be from evening to evening, not morning to morning, not, not morning to evening, but from evening to evening. Okay. That's the way I see it. Great question. Is, is afflict your soul the same thing as fasting? I don't believe it is. I don't believe it is. Okay. Because the scripture says that this is to be a Shabbat for us. We don't fast on Shabbats. If this is really to be a Shabbat, there should be no fasting. I believe the afflicting our souls is afflicting our souls, not our flesh. It's not telling us to go beat ourselves <laughs> with sticks or starve ourselves. That's not what the scripture is saying. It's saying, be sorry. Be sorry. A acknowledge your sin before me and be sorry. Be repentant. Cry out to me for mercy and, for re and in repentance. That's what it means to afflict your soul. It doesn't necessarily, as I see it, mean fasting. But some people see it a little differently, okay? Some people see it a little differently. All right. And so that's why this Daniel fast that we're on right now works because we're fasting from certain things, but we're still eating. We're still engaging in eating at the time of the Shabbats, okay? So I just wanted to share that with you. And continue on. The new moon is a minor festival that is linked with the Shabbat. They call it a minor festival. I'm going to say it's pretty important, but I just wanted to point that out. And also I'm going to skip down. It says the importance of the new moon lies in the fact that it is usually easily observable. Whereas the night of the full moon is not so easily determined. So this is talking about how some people are determining whether or not the new moon falls on the full moon, as indicated in the book of Psalms that I just read, that passage that I just read, or whether or not it's at the new moon at the first slither. It's very clear that it's the first slither. Okay. Thus, the new moon was traditionally marked by feasting in local community accompanied by religious ceremonies. Okay. So we've already read about David and Saul and all of that in Saul's table. So it's a time of gathering. It's a time of sacrifice. It's a time of worship. It's a time of meeting. It's a time of meeting with the most high. Okay. Meeting with the most high. We're going to get into that. So calculating the new moon. I kind of feel like we've already talked about this a bit. So we'll probably go through this pretty quickly. Calculating the new moon. So what you see on the screen is a calendar a calendar with the new moon cycles on it. Okay. And so what's determined, I don't know if you can see this, but it says Eve of the new moon, that Eve of the new moon is pretty dark. Okay. It's pretty dark. And then when you see the first sighting of that slither, just like Kafa Yahu was saying, when you see that first sighting of the slither of the new moon, that marks the first day of the month. Okay. And as you can see, the moon is waxing, meaning it's getting 
more light, more light, more light, more light, more light. So by, by the time you get to the 15th day of the month, and if it was the month of Nisan or Abib, it would be around the time of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as I mentioned before. You see, that moon is full, okay? So that feast day would fall on a full moon every year, every year. And so then at that point, on the 15th day, from that point, the moon begins to wane, meaning it's less light, less light, less light, less light, less light, until you get to the end of the month where the light disappears. And then you have a period, a transition period of about two days or so when you sit and you watch for the new moon. And that is how our ancestors did it, brothers and sisters. They determined the months by the moon. The word months is taken from the word months. It's literally determining when the moon says this next 28 or 30 or 29 day cycle begins. It's allowing the moon to speak as to the days of the month. That is what we did. And if you look at this calendar, you'll also see that the first day of the month has the slither of the moon and the first Shabbat has half moon. The second Shabbat has a full moon. The third Shabbat has a half moon and the fourth Shabbat has a slither of a moon. It, it's, just, it's just beautiful and ordered. It's ordered and structured and beautiful and wonderful. And I'm so grateful. Okay, so we're going to read this article, the seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets and the New Moon. What's the only feast that falls on a new moon? It's the Feast of Trumpets, the only one. It's the only one. I may have said atonement earlier, but it's the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets always begins on Tishri 1. The beginning of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar is always marked by a new moon. In Genesis 1.14, we read, Then Alua said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Brothers and sisters, the Mosai is telling us that the way that we calculate time is based on the sun and the moon and not even necessarily the stars. You don't necessarily need the stars to calculate time, but you need the sun and you need the moon. The two great lights that he created to separate and in indicate and to dictate the passage of time. The moon is one of those lights that marks the seasons. On the Hebrew calendar, a new month always begins on the evening that a sliver of the new moon appears. That is how the new month is determined, by the moon. In Leviticus 23, verses 24 through 25, we read, Tell the people of Yasharal in the seventh month, the first of the month, is to be for you a day of complete rest for remembering. A holy convocation announced with the blasts of shofar. Do not do any kind of ordinary work and bring an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. So this is an example of the new moon feasts that happens around the time of the, moon, of the new moon. Okay? All right? No, this is the seventh month. The seventh month, month of Tishri. On the first of the month. Day of Atonement. Here we see that Yahuwah has made sure that we always celebrate the Feast of Trumpets on the first of Tishri, which is a new moon and a new month. I wondered why. Why would Yahuwah put one of his holy days right on the day of the new moon on the first of the month? What does the Feast of Trumpets have to do with the beginning of a month? Here's an easy answer. A new month alerts us to a new season especially this one. Remember we discussed earlier in this lesson that there are four seasons and that there are certain months, the first day of that month indicates the beginning of a new season. Tishri one is the indication of the fall, the beginning of the fall season. Okay. And the feast of trumpets is meant to awaken us to this idea of the fall season, but also there's something that spiritually is speaking, the blowing of the trumpets, the time of the the new moon, the time of trumpets, the time of remembrance and the time of gathering. It's telling us that we're about to enter into a season that something pretty spectacular is going to happen during that season, either in their time or in a future time. And it's been purported, I don't know, but it's been purported that Messiah could likely return to the earth during the time of the Feast of Trumpets. Could that be why he said no man would know the day of the hour? 
because to determine when Tishri 1 is, you have to wait for the sighting of the new moon. Is it, It's possible. It's very possible. So we're going back to the calendar. And I've got a close-up of it so you can get a better look at it. You can see um, the new day, the new set-apart day, the new moon. And then you can see the waxing of the moon as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, more light, more light, more light, until that 15th day. And then it begins to wane. So it gets less and less and less and less and less, less light until you arrive at the end of the month, the end of the month. And then you wait to determine the new month, okay? And the Mosai tells us, and it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Shabbat to Shabbat, all mankind will come and bow before me. So this is a now thing. It was a then thing. It's a now thing. And it's also a future thing. Thus saith Yahuwah, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut six working days, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened, and the prince shall enter by way of the porch of that gate without, and it shall stand by the post of the gate. Then he shall go forth, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the door of this gate before Yahuwah, and the Shabbats, and the new moons. And I love reading this because when you read the book of um, Ezekiel chapters, I believe 44 through 46, 47, so it talks about the rebuilding, or it just talks about the temple, the construction of the temple. You wonder, why is this in here? Why, does, why did the Most High give Ezekiel such precise instructions on how to build a temple? Why is it? Is there going to be another rebuilding of a temple? Well, we are the temple, we know that, but is there going to be a physical temple? Well, if people are going to come about before the Most High at the new moons, they've got to have a place to come, right? So maybe so. I can't say yes or no 100%, but it's very possible. It's very possible. But before I go on further, I forgot to show you guys this chart, excuse me, this little video that I found that I wanted to show you the cycle of the new moon. It's really, really, it's really quick. And it's really cool. So take a look. So that's really cool. So I'm going to pause it right, like right at the beginning. Okay, right there. So this is what our ancestors would have been looking for at that first little slither of the new moon. They go, oh, there it is. There it is. We know we have a new moon now. Okay. Before that, it would have been completely dark. It would have been dark. See if I can get it to go back. It would have been, well, I can't, I can't get it to pause where I want it to, but it would have been completely dark. It would have been completely dark. And then the light and more light and more light. And this is called the waxing of the moon. And then you have the waning of the moon. So I just wanted to show you this quick little video of what it looks like sped up. That's what we're looking for, okay? That's what we're looking for. So let me remove that. Put my stream back up there and continue on. So the new moon and the Shabbat. We're gonna talk about this briefly before we end for the day. Yes, the dark moon is the end of the month. The dark moon is the end of the month. The new moon begins with the slither. Some people say the dark moon is the beginning of the month, but that's a debate that I'm not going to take on, but some people say it is, but I don't, I don't agree. And the reason I don't agree is because the father says that the moon and the sun are to be given to us for signs. How can the moon be a sign for us if you can't see it? A sign is something that is visible to the eyes or at least to the senses in some way. So if the moon is supposed to be a sign to us, you've got to be able to see it. If you can't see it, it's not a sign. So, in my opinion, the sighting of the new moon is when you can actually see it, not when it's got a dark face, okay? So I wanted to place on the screen uh, this word. It's called lunisolar. And we were I was talking about this earlier with Sister Talmita, that this is that we have a lunisolar constitution. I don't know what to call it, but the way that we calculate time and our Hebrew uh, cosmon cosmology is lunisolar. It's both using the sun and the moon, not just the moon, 
not just the sun, but both. And lunisolar means of or causing by both the sun and the moon, resulting from the united action or pertaining to the mutual relations of the sun and the moon. That portion of the annual processes of the equinoxes, which depends on the joint action of the sun and the moon. Okay. Let's see here. To when do you remember the weekly Shabbat? Okay. All right. Sister messengers um, doing a quiz in the chat. <laughs> okay. And so once again, we see this verse of scripture here. And Alua said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And Alua made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. So we know that the greater light is the sun and the lesser light is the, the moon. And the sun rules the day, the moon rules the night. These two lights are to be used to determine signs, seasons, days, and years to do it any other way is out of order. The current calendar that we have right now is a solar calendar. It doesn't acknowledge the moon at all. It's not, it's not even indicated in how we calculate time. It's just a completely solar calendar. I wonder why could it be sun worship, but be that as it may, this is the way the father wants us to calculate time using both the sun and the moon. Okay, so I just wanted to put this on the screen just to let you know that the word, the Hebrew word for the first crescent is called the Hodesh. Some people use a CH, some people use just H, Hodesh, and it just means new, to make new, to renew. It's as if, as I stated before, the moon was bright and lit and it went through a period of waning. It waxed strong, it became full, and then it waned and it waned and it waned and the less the light became less and less and less and less and then the light went out and when the light comes back it's seen as a renewal a renewal of the light a renewal of the life a renewal of the moon and every time you see that it's a reminder of the hope that we have in the most high it's a reminder of his faithfulness to keep his promises it's a reminder that he brings life to dead things. Every single time we sit and we wait for that new moon, for that renewal of the moon, we can be reminded of the renewal that's coming to us. We are like that moon, brothers and sisters. We're like the moon. We're like the moon. We began strong as a nation. We waxed strong and strong and strong. The most I brought us out of Egyptian bondage, took us into the promised land, we were able to defeat our enemies by the power of the Most High, and we had power through the through our ancestors, Dawood, David. The Most High gave him peace on every side. He completely conquered. We were waxing strong. And then sin entered, and we began to wane and wane and wane and wane, and our light got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and we went dark. We were scattered to the four nations, punished and judged by the Most High. Dark, hidden, just like the moon. Hidden, dark unseen. We're there, but we can't be seen. But the Most High is looking for that slither of light that he has already ordained that would happen. That He has lit a fire in his nation again, and the world is going to see the light and say, wait a minute, wait a minute now. I thought they were gone. I didn't know those Hebrew people survived. Yes, we're still here. We may be unseen to your eyes, we may be in our dark moon phase right now, but the Most High has every intention to renew his nation. Just as he renews the, the moon every month, he has every intention of renewing his nation. Hallelujah. And I want to say that in our experience right now with the Most High, there may be, we're in the new moon phase. Maybe metaphorically speaking, the Most High is just beginning to shine his light on us again. We're just beginning to experience some of the Bataka again. The curses are abating away from our nation. We're coming into truth. We're coming into the awakening. We're coming into an awareness of who we are. The Most High saying, those my people. They're my people. And my light is shining on them once again. And I'm going to cause them to wax 
stronger and stronger and stronger. And when they get to the full moon this time, because they have learned, don't go whoring around with other nations. When they get to the full moon stage this time, they're going to remain. They're going to remain in their full strength. No more waning. No more turning back. No more sinning. No more turning to the weak and beggarly elements. No more. They're going to stand in that Sabbath day, that 15th day. Look at this calendar with me. The 15th day, strong moon, strong, fully lit, fully illuminated. No more waning. No more. No more. This is what's happening to us. And as you look at this calendar in front of you, you can see how it begins small. Despise not the day of small beginnings. It begins on that first day. But as a nation, we're building and building. We're rising and rising and getting stronger. By the time we get to that 15th day, you see the, full, the most high power. Look at that. Look at that moon in its full strength. Hallelujah. 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 All praises to the most high. Hallelujah. So, Shabbat. Shabbat does not mean Saturday. And I know if I were to ask some people, they would say Shabbat means Saturday. It does not. The Most High did not invent the word Saturday. As I discussed, Saturday, Saturday is about Saturn's wor Saturn worship. So the Most High did not invent the word Saturday. It didn't come from him. Okay? So Shabbat does not mean Saturday. It means the seventh day. And technically, the seventh day's ceasing or the seventh day's rest. That's what it means. Okay? And that is determined by the new moon. The new moon tells us when the Shabbats are. Okay? So to assume that just because it's Saturday, it's a Shabbat, that's out of order. It's, it's wrong. It's not correct. It's pagan is what it is. So what we're going to do, because we're in a time of new moon, and during the time of new moon is a time where the father draws near. It's a time where the father told me, because I, I said, Father, why do you want me to teach this? Why is this important? He said, because on my new moons, I draw near. I give a special grace to my people where they can come and consult me on things and seek my face. And the interference, the interference between the earthly realm and the heavenly realm is diminished. It's almost like he told me, like the veil between the earthly realm and the heavenly realm heavenly realms are thinned out so that you could hear from the most high. That's why so many of our ancestors received instruction and direction on the new moon, because it, it's a time. It's almost like the father set it up to say, this is a time where I'm going to make it extra easy for you to hear from me. I'm going to make it extra easy for you to come and make your vows before me. I'm going to make it extra easy for you to come and bring your sacrifices and repent for your sins and receive my instruction and my correction, and my direction. So as we are entering this time right now of the new moon, the new moon season, I want us to take these things before the most high. What should we do? How do you want us to handle this information that we've been given? What should we do with it? We don't want to be rash. We want to be wise. And we want to be prayerful. Father, what do you want us to do with this information? Show us. And as we seek his face, not only during a time of new moon, but a time of this Daniel fast, I believe the Most High will be faithful to indicate to us what he wants us to do. Okay, so we're, we're wrapping it up, brothers and sisters. We're wrapping it up. Philo was a prominent Jewish leader who lived in Alexandria from about 20 BCE to about 50 CE and was a contemporary of both Yahusha, the Messiah, and Paul. He was aware what the Savior and his followers considered was the new moon. In his treatise on special laws, book 2, 11, Philo discusses the biblical observa um, observances. Note how he describes the new moon. It is that which comes after the conjunction, which is the day of the new moon in each month. In his detailed discussion of the new moon, Philo describes what constitutes a new moon. Quote, at the time of the new moon, the sun begins to illuminate the moon with light, which is visible to the outward senses. Then she displays her own beauty to the beholders. Okay, so he's indicating here that indeed the new moon comes with light, not with a dark face, but with a slither of light, as we just discussed. 
As Philo noted, the new moon follows the conjunction, but is not the conjunction itself. His observation reveals to us what was considered the new moon in Yahusha's day and what the Savior himself also observed as the new moon. That is all we need to know to realize what still constitute a biblical new moon. It is that first sighting of the slither. It's when the moon is illuminated. That is the new moon. So you can find that Hebraic at hebraicroots.com, the rest of that article. Okay, and that, I want to say that is what it would look like. It's a pretty picture, but I think that it would probably be a little bit thinner than this. It'd be a little thinner than this, I believe, is what you would see in the heavens as you look for the new moon. Okay, and the word, I've already discussed this with you. I just want to put it on the screen. The word for, for new moon is Kadesh, um, or yeah, Kadesh sounds like, Ruach HaKodesh, doesn't it? But it's Kadesh, and it just means new moon or renewed moon, okay? And the root word is Kadash, and the Kadash means to renew or to repair. So it's almost like this idea of the moon being repaired or renewed after a period of darkness. And as I stated earlier, the same thing is happening to our nation. After a period of darkness, brothers and sisters, we're being repaired and we're being renewed. So, Kadash, new moon, not necessarily, renewed moon, repaired, restored moon, from darkness to light, from darkness to light. Hallelujah. Okay. And there's just the calendar again. From darkness to light. And that is what the moon represents, going from a time of darkness to light. So what is the new moon? I'm going to summarize and we're going to end for today. What is the new moon? The new moon is an appointed time, a festival day in the nation of Yasharal in which animals were to be sacrificed, grain and drink offerings made, and a feast held. It was a day of no commerce, no trade. Work was to be limited directly for work for the most high. It was to be a day to define and determine the beginning of the new month and to determine the Shab the Shabbats for that month. And it was a time to draw near unto the Most High for answers. So with that said, I want to go back to the calendar that I just showed you. And I want to show you on the screen how the Sabbaths are determined by the new moon. So you see the new moon on the first. On the first. Count seven days, and that will give you your first Sabbath day of the month. Okay? And brothers and sisters, these Shabbats are always going to be on these same days of the month. They're always going to be the same because the Shabbat is always going to be seven days from the new moon. And when you count seven days from the new moon, you're always going to arrive at the eighth. The eighth, you add, you count seven days from the eighth, you're always going to arrive at the 15th. You count seven days from the 15th, you're always going to arrive at the 22nd. And then finally the 29th. So the Shabbat days, once you determine the new moon, are always going to be the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th, okay? Always. Once you determine the new moon, okay? So if you're if you're deciding that you want to do this, that you want to start keeping a calendar and determining when the new moons are, you're going to find that your Shabbats are always going to be on the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. But what day of the week is it going to be on is going to be determined by the new moon. For example, if the new moon falls on Let's see, if the new moon falls on a Thursday, okay? Let's say, for instance, the new moon falls on a Thursday. I want you to tell me, what day will Shabbat be on? I'm waiting. If the new moon falls on a Thursday, what day will the first Shabbat be on? What day of what, you know, what their day, day of the, I know I'm using their technical days of the week or pagan days of the week, but I want to be able to do that for the purpose of communication because we're communicating here in Babylon. So what day of their calendar day would the Shabbat fall on if the new moon was found, discovered on a Thursday? Yes. 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 Oh, sorry, I didn't quite mean, yes. That's it. That's it. It'd be Friday. It'd be Friday because it's eight days. So the original day was on a Thursday. So essentially it would be 
Count seven days. Yes. So I'm going to end for today, brothers and sisters, so that I can um, rest my body um, on this day that we are choosing to celebrate the Shabbat, whether it's the Shabbat today or not, really, truly. We're choosing to do it on this day, and the Father sees our sacrifice. He sees it. He knows. He's not going to say, I'm not going to accept your sacrifice when he sees us doing the best we can. He knows we're learning. He knows these things were lost to us. He knows that we forgot. He knows. And he's, he's slowly restoring these things unto us. And so for, the, for those of you who've been studying this stuff for a long time and you know, start teaching. Because there are those of us who need to learn. We don't know. So start teaching. Okay. Some Ravicia says the seed of Israel's calendars and not count the new moon as the first day. Well, then that has to be ignored. Ignore that. Ignore that because it is the new moon is the first day. It just is. So don't, don't, don't acknowledge anything that will not acknowledge that the first day is the new moon. Okay. Because <laughs> we don't want to go into from one error into another error. Daughter of the Most High says, what if the time zones are significant for us? Is it not also a tradition of man to count time that way? I believe it is. I believe it is. And so just you thinking that thought is significant because it's the Father teaching us and showing us to think another way. Okay? It's really good. It's a really good point. Really good point. <laughs> 78 vets said, I won't quit, but I might call off. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you might, you might, sister. You just might. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So Van says, so as of today, what is the next Shabbat? Um, well, it all depends on the sighting of the new moon. We haven't sighted that as of yet. So according to uh, Kafa Yahu, who studies these things, see, I Googled when the next new moon was, and they said it was today. But there are those out there who are actually looking for the sighting. And once it's sighted, then that's the first day. And then whatever day that is, take that day and then add a day. And that's going to be your Shabbat. So if the new moon is sighted on, what's today? Saturday? Then your, your Shabbat is going to be Sunday. If the new moon is sighted on Sunday, then your Shabbat is going to be on Mondays. The next four Mondays are going to be your Shabbats. Okay? And that's how it works. And so, like I said, if you have a job and you can't take those times off, just be at rest in your heart. Be extra prayerful, be extra mindful, and ask the Father to work your circumstances out so that you can honor him on your on the feast days, okay? Yes, 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 Sister Kathy. The Father's full of grace for those who has to work, and he will deliver us from our captivity so that we can truly serve him as ordained. Absolutely, 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 sister. So he knows, he knows, and he will work it out for us. You know, we didn't think it was going to be easy leaving Babylon because Babylon got itself all intermingled in our stuff. It's it's in every aspect of our of our being. Think about it. Everything we do is based on what Babylon taught us. So we have to extricate ourselves. We have to get ourselves out of their nonsense and return to the Father. And it's going to take time. It's going to take some time. But we have the Father's grace with us. We have him. Hallelujah. Sister Ray Towns, she's always got a wonderful script. She says, for Yahuwah, Yahuwah, uh, for, Yahuwah, Yah for Yahuwah Elohim is the sun and a shield. Yahuwah will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So if it's your desire and your goal and your hope to be able to keep all the Shabbat, present that before the Father. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He knows it's our desire. He knows. Okay. He knows. Hallelujah. So for all intents and purposes, the day you decide to keep the Shabbat until we get more information, just, just be at rest with it and be at peace with it. Don't stress. Don't fret. Don't be condemned. Just know that we're doing the best we can today. And then as more information comes, the Father will help us to make the correct decisions about how to proceed ahead. No condemnation. And I want to make sure you all know that. There is no condemnation in this message. It's it's meant to be instructional, not condemnatory, okay? There's no condemnation. The Father's teaching us. He's teaching us. Hallelujah. So, yes, take all this to the Father. Take it all to the Father and let him speak to your heart. Take it all to the Father. Hallelujah. 
um, flavored, favored, favored says, this is not going to be easy, but I'm always thrilled when logic prevails. <laughs> not everything is overly spiritual. This just makes sense. Oh yes, you're right. My sister, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. It just does. Absolutely. Absolutely makes sense. And um, Brother Yahudin says, come out of her, my people, and know your Lua is El El Yon. He is the most high. Yes, he is. He is the most high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, peace and blessings to all of you. I just pray that the most high will Baruch and keep you, brothers and sisters, and that he would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and that Yahuwah Sabaoth would lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, shalom, peace in every area of life. And Father, as we come into these new understandings and things, we are not 100% yet. We're still getting our sea legs, so to speak, with regard to these things. Help us to understand. Help us to know what you want us to do. Let us not be condemned. Let us not be condemned at all because we are trying to do what's right in your sight. Teach us and instruct us and show us the way that we are to go. Let us know what you want us to do and then clear the path for us to be able to walk in the path that you have ordained. I pray, Father, that you would baruch and uplift each of my brothers and sisters here today and that you would cause them to walk in the hope of your goodness. Because if you're revealing these things to us, it means you're looking to have an appointment with us. <laughs> that is just so wonderful. You're, you're telling us, come and see me because you want an appointment. And we're looking forward to hearing the things you have to tell us. Thank you so much, Father. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for this beautiful day that you've created for us. Because every day that you create is a baraka. We love you. We honor you. We esteem you high. And we thank you for your son that you sent. Hallelujah. We love you. Hallelujah. Hua. Brothers and sisters, I love you all so very much. I'm so grateful that you joined me today. I'm so grateful that we could all learn together. And so take what you've learned, take it to the Father and see what he says, get further instructions, and then proceed ahead. And we'll continue to talk about these things, I'm sure, as the Father instructs and teaches us. I love you all. I pray that you have a wonderful rest of your day. And may the Most High keep you as you continue to rise. We're rising, brothers and sisters. Yasharal is rising. Kwam Yasharal.